can hear me all right? <coughs> can everybody hear me? Are we <coughs> more or less loud enough? Yeah? Microphone's working, let's go. Cool. Morning. morning. Um, this morning, uh, it's on my heart to talk about um, the building of the walls in Nehemiah. Well, that's what the whole book's about, really. There's this... this um, these walls that need building, and Nehemiah is, um, he, he's going to do it, he's the man in charge, and he goes ahead and builds these walls. I'm going to read a bit from um, Nehemiah chapter 2, I'm going to read verse 17 down to 20, I think it is. But there's just a few things that I'd like to pick up on from that, um, and then we'll talk a bit about it. And it says... So I came to, oh no, sorry, it says, uh, I said to them, you see the trouble we're in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burnt. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we may, long, we may no longer suffer disgrace. I told them that the hand of my God had been gracious upon me and also the words that the king had spoken to me. Then they said, let us start building. So they committed themselves to the common good. But when Sambalat, the Horonite, and Tobiah the Ammonite's official, Geshem the Arab heard, uh, they mocked and ridiculed us, saying, What is this that you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, The God of heaven is the one who will give us success, and we, his servants, are going to start building. But, it, uh, but you have no share or claim or historic rights in Jerusalem. So Nehemiah kind of told these guys the score. Um, Nehemiah's work on the walls was... His, his legacy. I'm, um, I'm really looking at the way that the people um, reacted. You know, when Nehemiah started to talk to them, the people reacted in a certain way. And it's not because, um, it, it wasn't because immediately they wanted the walls built, but it was a preparation for something. You know, that they saw a work that needed to be done, and... Um, that they, they did it. And it wasn't necessarily, it was a work that was going to last, as I'm trying to say. It was a work that was going to stay forever. It wasn't just an immediate thing for their, um, just for them. It was going to last for generations to come. Uh, it was a work of preparation. They, they weren't aware. They were making the city ready to receive Jesus. They were making this place ready for God to come down. And this is where God was going to demonstrate how humanity can be um, brought back to him. And, uh, you know, th there's, there's some people in the congregation, two of you, having a baby. There's one of them that isn't here right now. But um, when you have a baby, there are things that take place, aren't there? There are certain preparations that you do. And um, they take place mentally and, and physically. There's these things that you kind of you have to line yourself up in your head, really, when you're having a baby, don't you? You, you kind of... You, <laughs> you, 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 you have to prepare yourself mentally for your life not being your own anymore and you being in charge of somebody else. And this is kind of what happens when they were... Um, when they were building the walls. This is the urgency that we as a church need to have to build us up, to build the church up and to help the church grow. We need to have this urgency of, um, you know, when we're going to have a baby. There's this, you know, when, when you're pregnant, I know personally because I've been pregnant before, um, when you're pregnant, there's, you know you're having a baby, don't you? There's something that's happening, and there's a sign, you're aware of what's going to happen, you're going to have a baby. So you prepare for it, because it's going to happen. And that's how we need to be in the church. We need to be prepared, ready for the church to grow, because it's going to happen. And we need to have this urgency that we need to... Um, be ready for it. If we look at the church, uh, not just this church, but churches in general, there is um, th there's something not quite right with them. If I was to say everybody between 18 and 30, put your hands in the air. If anybody's between 18 years old and 30 years old, put your hands up. What's that? We've no, got three. Is that three of us? Me, Dan, and Amy. Jenkins, how old are you? Uh, 
24, who they're, they're four of us. They're, and anybody sort of above that, can put your hands up, please. <laughs> oh, that's the rest of the church. <laughs> that we, we have a generation that's kind of not here. There's a generation that's missing, and we need to, we need to bring that in to, um, to help the church build up. We need to be prepared and ready for the next wave of God's people to come in. And that's what they were doing when they were building the uh, when they were building the walls that they were putting these walls up, and they were they were preparing the city not just for themselves but for the next generation. Sometimes we kind of we uh, as a church we our Christian walk is so hard we forget about that sometimes, don't we? Do we? It is is the modern Christian walk so difficult and the constant attack from the enemy? And is it that treacherous to walk the Christian walk that we can't actually? prepare for the next generation while doing it. You know, is it just is it just enough to make it through life alive and come out at the end of it saying I've walked this Christian walk, but haven't made room for the next generation. Um, if we look at Nehemiah and look at how he dealt with this work, you know, persecution to the people of God, this antagonism that, that, that we get isn't a new thing. And the strain and struggle to, to build up and prepare for the next wave of God's people isn't, it's not new it, it's not something that's just suddenly appeared it's been going on for years and years and years and Nehemiah when he was building the church he had, he had some persecutors, he had these people who were just coming and mocking, they were causing great grief to him and uh, these three people, they kind of signify the struggles that we have in building the church I am um, I like names. I like looking at what names mean. I'm a bit of a word nerd. I like to go through. Uh, I've got a dictionary. I enjoy reading the dictionary. That's uh, I don't know whether it's a prideful or arrogant thing, but I like to find out new words that use them. And people go, "What?" I go, "Ah, it means this." <laughs> but no, yeah. But I like to look through the Bible and look at people's names and see what they mean. And um, uh, Sambalat, which which is one of the name of his persecutors. I, I looked at his name. His name means strength. His name means strength. And this signifies to us the difficulty of the task at hand. You know, when we're thinking about building for the next wave and building the church up, this um, strength, this attack from the devil um, will always help us to, to, to realise just how big this task is. Just how important it is. Just how um, how much we need to do it, how difficult it is. You know, sometimes you like, we, we come, up, come up against the task and we think, hang on a second, this is too hard. That's what the devil wants us to do. Let's just come in, look at the church and go, how are we ever going to build this up? How is this ever going to work? But um, we have to remember that, uh, well, the Bible says in 1 John 4, 4, you are of God, little children, and you have overcome them. Because he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. So we need to remember that when we come against tasks, when we come against this problem of building the church up and how difficult it seems, we must remember that we have God in us. We're on the winning side. Um, in 1 John 4.4, 4, it says you've overcome them. Not overcoming, not about to overcome, but you have already overcome them. We're on the winning side. So whenever you look at the task and you think, oh my goodness, this is so hard. Or you think, oh, how is it going to work? Remember that you've already won. We're on the winning side, we've got God in us, and that's going to help us to um, work out this task and help build the church up. Now, the second person, Tobiah the Ammonite, is, um, this is a brilliant person. His name is, is splendid. It actually means the goodness of God. But it's taken, it's taken to mean good for nothing when you look at who he is. He's an Ammonite, in the context of being an Ammonite, a person who's been, um, they've been the ag antagonists of the children of God right the way through our history. So when you get this person who is called the goodness of God, but is actually an enemy of God, it, it translates into good for nothing. It's, a, it's an ironic name, and uh, he signifies this sin and distraction that takes us away from the work. Now this could be temptation, Good. Anything that is good for nothing, I'm pretty sure we can think of things in our lives that are good for nothing. I'm, uh, I'm good at being distracted. I can quite easily just wander off and do something that's completely irrelevant. 
I like to I like to find out things. So sometimes I can be like, I'll be doing Bible study or I'll be looking at something and I'll go, I'll get sidetracked and I'll start doing something else. I remember that I need to record a TV show. So I'll go onto the TV thing and I start to record it. And then I look at the stuff that I've already put and think, oh, I've not seen that yet, I'll start watching that. And before you know it, I'm off doing something else. My Bible's still left over and I'm thinking, hang on a second. I've, I've, I've just, I've been distracted and sucked straight in. And I don't know about you, but that's quite easy for me to do. I get into everything. I like doing lots of things and I'll be, I'll be forever learning something new or doing something new. And it takes me away from the work of God sometimes. And we have to uh, pull ourselves back in and um, try not to be distracted. Sin also distracts us in his way. Sin is good for nothing. Um, all of us sin, and we've got to um, kind of realise we have to man up and ask for forgiveness and go back to the work of God. You know, um, God wants us to work for him. God sent his son to die so that we could be forgiven. You know, we're not supposed to have this, and there isn't supposed to be a shame involved when we go and ask for forgiveness afterwards. We're supposed to have received grace walk in the fact that we know that we've been forgiven. Forgiven? Forgiven? Away. <laughs> I knew it was going to happen, Gina. I knew it was. <laughs> now that we've been forgiven. <laughs> so there's, there's all these distractions, this temptation and trauma and uh, sin that can take us away from the work of God. Um, Philippians 4.8 tells us how to deal with this, how to overcome this. It says, finally, brothers, whatever is true... Whatever is honourable, honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So you know when you're distracted, or you're overcome by sin, or you feel this trauma, start to praise God. Look at the things that God's done for you. Look at everything, you know, the whole of creation. And I love the way that this works out. You know, God's stamped this with irony squared. This guy's name means the goodness of God. He is an enemy of God, and it's taken ironically to mean good for nothing. These sins that we get into, and when we start to become distracted and do things that are good for nothing, the thing that we have to concentrate on is the goodness of God. And it's the literal meaning of this guy's name in Hebrew. It's like, we it's twisted right back around, and God's like, oof, had it. Irony, I like it. Um, yeah, the, <laughs> the third person here is Geshem. Geshem, the third antagonist of um, Nehemiah, and the third uh, thing that the devil will use to stop us from building up the church. His name literally means rain. Um, has anybody ever, <laughs> anybody ever thought, I've got tons of things to do today, got up in the morning, opened the curtains and thought, that. Nah. <laughs> Close the curtain for the night, weather's bad, I'm going back to bed. That, that, <laughs> that, that distraction, that kind of, the situation's never right. You know, if, um, if we walked in here and thought about building up the church, we can go, hang on a second, yeah, but this needs to be sorted out first. Yeah, we need to sort the pews out. We can do a painting this. We can't have too many kids in the Sunday school room because it's not big enough yet. The, the, the situation we feel is never right to be building. And this is what this guy's name means. It's, it's the rain. When you're trying to build up and you look out the window and you think, this weather's terrible. I'm not going to do anything today. That, that's what this guy's name means. And we need to kind of... We need to... Um, get more... You know, involved with the things that God's doing. Help, help things that are moving. In Nehemiah 2.18, um, part of the passage that I just read, Nehemiah... Um, yeah, it's brilliant, the way the people work. It says, uh, God told them, uh, I told them how the hand of my God had been favourable to me, also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. Then they said, let us arise and build, arise and build. so they put their hands to the good work. They saw where God was working, and they moved in. They looked at Nehemiah, the grace that had been given to Nehemiah, and they said, let's get in on that. You know, if you read through what Nehemiah actually did, what happened to Nehemiah, he prayed to God, and uh, the king gave him leave. He, the king didn't um, attack him. It wasn't a vast amount that seemed to happen to him in the first few chapters, but the people saw the, the little thing that God had done, the grace that he'd been shown, and jumped on it and said, let's build up, let's get together for the greater good. Sometimes we kind of, we get up and we go, oh, well, I know we've been commissioned by God to go out and make disciples of the world, and uh, 
I know we've got all these tools and resources for evangelism, we've been blessed with a giant building and all this stuff to do, but I'm just waiting for a sign from God to go out and do it. It's like, we need to get on where God's blessed, we need to jump on it and um, get like these people who have built the wall. You know, God's blessing Alpha, let's get involved in that. God's blessing the magazine um, outreach, let's get involved in that. God's blessing the beach team, let us go out and work, let us arise and build, let us go out and help these things. Look at areas in the church, within the church, that God's blessing, and jump on them. Let's get involved and start start to build up. God's blessing the church with people who can aid in outreach. People who are in positions to um, just gain knowledge of where the church needs to be moving. People who have their ears to the ground. Let's get involved with those people. Let's get blessing those people. Let's, let's help those people work out. It's... Um, this is what we do. You know, when Jesus spoke in, in John 14, 12, he says about, um, you know, greater things than these will do. But, you know, with Jesus, we will do greater things. And that is because we should be preparing for the next generation. There's absolutely no excuse for the generation who is after us to have less than us in Jesus than we have. There is no excuse whatsoever. God's commissioned us to go. Let's go. We take a step forward. We make ground. We, we, we go from glory to glory. And the generation after us should be living in that. They should be walking within that. We should be building up and up and up and up and up. Uh, I'm not saying becoming rich and famous. I'm not saying have a massive, massive building. But I'm saying in Jesus, the way that we walk as a church and the way that um, the church flows with God should be moving closer and closer and closer and the next generation should be doing the same. They should have greater things than we have. They should be seeing God do greater things. There should be more baptisms than we have. They, they should be moving forward. It's all about opening doors. You know, King David is... I, I, you read through the life of King David, it's absolutely brilliant. He was a door opener. But he, his life was... Tremendous. He did loads and loads and loads. But uh, the work that he did, he, he was a man of war, and um, because he shed blood, he couldn't build God's temple. I'm going to read uh, part of just a passage, five verses from uh, First Chronicles, and it's for chapter 22, verses 5 to 10. And it reads David said, We should build a great temple for the Lord, which will be famous everywhere for its greatness and beauty. But my son Solomon is young. He hasn't yet learned what he needs to know. So I will prepare for the building of it. So David got many materials um, ready before he died. Then David called his son Solomon and told him to build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel. David said to him, My son, I wanted to build the temple for worshipping the Lord my God. But the Lord spoke his word to me. David, you have killed many people. You have fought many wars. You cannot build a temple for worship to me. Because you have killed many people, but you will have a son, a man of peace and rest, and will give him rest from all of his enemies around him. His name will be Solomon, and I will give Israel peace and quiet for he is king. Solomon will build the temple for worshipping me, and he will be my son, and I will be his father, and make his kingdom strong. Um, someone from his family will rule Israel forever. So, David wanted to build the temple, but he couldn't. God told him not to. But he didn't spit his dummy out and just give up then. He didn't like, you know, throw his dummy off. I don't care, I don't bother, I'll just die. I'm, uh, you know, I'm a deathbed, I'm not very happy about this. I wanted to do it, I can't do it. No. Uh, you want to talk about difficult families, do you look at, look at the life of David and some of his sons? He's got sons left, right, and centre, and so many wives and so many children all over the place. But, um, God told him that Solomon would build the temple. So David prepared the materials for Solomon to build. He didn't just give up. He didn't say, okay then, it's your job to build the temple. Off he trots. What he did was, he said, God said, I can't build this temple. God said, I can't do this. But there's no reason I can't prepare this to help the next generation. There's no reason I can't do everything in my power to bring this stuff together to help the next generation build up. And that's what David did, and that's, what, that's how 
we should be doing it, making extensive preparations for the next generation to come in. So, you know, holding the door open for the next wave of Christians to come in. And um, as, as church in general, we tend to get a little bit... We can get comfortable sometimes, can't we, as church? We can become a little bit churchified. We like church. We come to church because it's our church and it's the thing that we like to do. And um, But that can often put people off. That can often... Um, uh, worry people that kind of pe- people don't like to come into situations where they're feeling out of place. Um, who was it who somebody said that they, they they don't like coming into the church and walking past all of the people that sat down because it unnerves them. It makes them feel uncomfortable and nervous. But it, we need to be making um, opening up the doors to let people come in. We need to invite friends to church, ask them to be critical. Ask them to come in and say, what do you think um, we could do to help uh, the church become more open? To make the church more um, accessible to the outside world? Because often we can come in, we get church, we know how church is going to go, we've got our order of service, but the people outside haven't got a clue about that. If you go to a bookies, Go into a bookies and put a bet on. How many of you go into bookies? I don't know, personally. But that kind of feeling, that I'm not encouraging you to go and gamble, don't you? <laughs> but that kind of feeling, going, going, walking in somewhere and not knowing what's going on. There's screens everywhere, there's people everywhere, people are talking to one another. You don't know where to go. You don't know what to do. It's just completely alien to you. That's the feeling that people have when they walk into church on the street. That's the feeling that people get. They walk in, they don't know what's going on. They've got, when I first walked into a church, I was gobsmacked because somebody welcomed me. That threw me off straight away. It was kind and nice and gentle and it's all supposed to happen. But look, nobody's ever done that before. I walked through the door and somebody shook my hand and said, God bless you. And I'm like, and sneeze. <laughs> Thank you. What do you say to that? As a, as a non-Christian walking to a what, what do you say to somebody who says, God bless you? It's like, back at you. Thank you. Cheers. Um, cool. And I don't know how to state that. that. That's how the world is with the church nowadays. You know, you don't know... They're unsure of what's going on. They don't know where to come in. Particularly this church is a beautiful building, but there's so many doors, they don't kind of know which way they're facing, what's going on. But invite friends to church. Invite friends to friends to church and ask them to be critical. That has to be horrible, but ask them to say, you know, how could this be a little bit easier? How would you feel about coming into this place? And really get a grasp on how, how the outside feels about how we are. And that can help us to bring in the next wave of people. That can help us to bring in this next generation and build up the church. I've, I've got no doubt in my mind that we could do it um, together as a fellowship. I've got no doubt in my mind that God's got his hand on this place. We can build this place up and we can have this place full of the next generation of people. And uh, keep it in mind, you know, that, that feeling, uh, that pregnant feeling, knowing you've got a baby and there's something coming. Keep that in mind when you go out and talk to people about Jesus. Keep that in mind when you come to church on Sunday. That something's gestating. So something's on its way. You know, th- there is something that's going to come to this church. It's going to be the next wave of people. There is nothing that's going to stop it because God wants his church to grow. You know, it, it says in the word, the gates of hell can't prevail over this church. That's us. That's us. You know, there, there's, you know, Satan and the devil cannot win over what we've got going on. And uh, just, just keep that pregnancy in mind. Keep that, you know, there's going to be something that's going to bloom forth. It's going to happen. And we're going to have this next wave of people in here, this next wave of Christians. And we need to help build and prepare for that. It's uh, it's wonderful to see how the church grows. I love to look at, so I love to look at, um, you know, if you read through the Bible and see how the church grew, and just how from Adam and Eve, the whole of humanity grew. And if you imagine it on a piece of paper, and just sort of stemming out into like, this tree diagram of, of the whole of the earth, and God sees all of that. And God has a plan for St. Paul Baptist Church. God has a plan for this building. God has a plan for each and every one of you. And God knows each and every one of you. And uh, it's really helpful to keep that in mind when we, um, when we look at church building and we look at how we should come together and build the church. You know, the people that Nehemiah brought together, they looked at God's grace they said, you know, let's look at, they said, um, 
they looked upon how God had been gracious to him and what the king had said to him, and they said, let's start building. And that's what we need to be doing. We need to be looking at where God's been gracious to us as a body and to us individually and say, let's start building and really start to build on that. I'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we are a work in progress. Father, we thank you that you are helping um, this church to grow. Lord, I pray that you be with us, Lord. Heavenly Father, I pray that you just bless this church with an influence, the next generation, Lord, and help us to build on the things that we have. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. Lord, we pray that when we build, we look at your Son. Heavenly Father, we pray that you keep our eyes firmly on the cross. You help us to look upon where you've been gracious to us and say, let us arise and build. Let's all keep our eyes on where the Son of God was crucified for, for us. Help us to remember that we aren't worthy of any of this. But yet you came down and you gave your life so that we could become children of God. Heavenly Father, I pray that you help us to keep that in mind. Lord, I pray that you help us to remember that this church isn't ours but yours. Lord, I pray that you help us to build this up. Heavenly Father, I pray that you help us to prepare for the next wave. Lord, I pray for people to come in and to <coughs> want to find out about who you are. And Father, I pray for a receptive heart within this congregation. Lord, I just pray that you bless this house. I pray that you bless these people. Lord, I just pray that you keep your hand upon us as we go about our week, Lord. And I pray that you help us to be thinking about how we can be building up, thinking about how we can be working, and thinking about how we can help your church to grow and build it up for it by brick. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we'll close with um, our last song, isn't it?